Hello, I'm the Media Wiz, because one art form wasn't enough, and we're back at it again with another vlog video. So, today we're going to be talking about three movies, and the reason I'm doing this as a vlog is because they were all requested by the same person, Emily. I feel like it would be appropriate to talk about these movies all in one video, because in a lot of ways, these movies kind of reminded me of stuff you'd see being reviewed on Red Letter Media. You know, your crappy comedies that are really low budget and straight to video, and your crappy horror films, whether they're 90s, 2000s, shot on video movies, or, you know, low budget, straight to video horror crap. And the three movies in question are Spoof, based on a true movie, Skeleton Key 2, 667, Neighbor of the Beast, and lastly, uh, Summer of Massacre. So, uh, in that exact order, that's how I'm going to go through the movies. So if you've kept up with some of my older reviews, like from years and years and years ago, uh, you probably remember that I have a history with bad parody movies. Disaster Movie was one that I reviewed, and it's still one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Um, and I've also sat through sketch comedy movies, like Movie 43 and Inappropriate Comedy, and it, it, for a while it felt like those kind of movies were petering out. But in the last few years, it didn't really seem like parody movies like this, you know, the Seltzerberg era parody movies, or movies from Craig Moss, you know, the same guy who did a... Uh, 41-year-old virgin who knocked up Sarah Marshall and felt super bad about it, and Breaking Wind, which was his Twilight parody. Movies like that felt like they kind of sizzled out. It felt like there wasn't a lot of those kind of movies anymore. Um, this movie feels like it was trying to kind of resurrect that, because uh, pretty much their idea of spoof or parody mostly just relies on references. And... I will admit, some of them mildly amusing, but, well, okay, here's the thing. Unlike Movie 43 or Inappropriate Comedy, which had a framing device, like, the whole selling point of this movie was that it's a movie that doesn't have a framing device. From beginning to end, an almost 100-minute movie, they have, like, a parody every minute. And so what you have is just a series of little vignettes, like, little quick parodies that go on for like at least 30 seconds maybe 30 seconds to a minute i mean i like sketch comedy shows that are scatterbrained and are very like quick with some of their skits some skits last longer than others uh you look at stuff like monty python or mr show um or even something recently like i mean eric andre show is very random and very scattershot and I really like that one. Going into this movie, I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, I should have seen the warning signals when I saw that the director didn't really do a whole lot else. Uh, but even for 2017, even for like a low budget straight to video, or I guess streaming service maybe, I found this movie on Tubi for free. So it was like, all right, well, it was, at least I could find it. At least I was able to find this movie. Here's the problem with the movie's setup. They keep relying on a lot of the same source material every few minutes. Like, every five minutes, they keep doing the same James Bond parody every so often. And the first time they do it, it's mildly amusing. Um, they put it on the poster as well. Uh, it's, you know, a parody of the James Bond intro where, you know, you have James Bond staring down a gun barrel, you know, but he's quick on the draw, shoots, and then blood oozes down. So the joke here is that he walks out, and then he gets shot first, and then he falls down flat. And it's like, okay, that's funny. That's pretty amusing. But every five minutes, they keep doing a variation of that same bit. And, I mean... It does escalate, but after a while, it's like, okay, you've done the same James Bond reference. It's like, we're kind of done with that. And they do that, like, every few minutes. It's the same joke or variation of a joke. Um, like, they keep referencing movies that Alfred Hitchcock directed. Uh, and instead of referencing specific scenes from those movies, they keep referencing the famous Alfred Hitchcock introduction where, like, there's the outline and then his silhouette steps into frame and, you know, they have that do -do 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 music. In between each of the skits, there's, like, a quick title card. In Comic Sans, except this time birds is spelled with a Z instead of an S. And there's lots of that all throughout this movie. It's like, you know, oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but Texas has a Z instead of an S, and Massacre has two Zs instead of two Ss. Uh, Jaws, but instead of an S, it's a Z. 
Rocky, but instead of with a K, it's with an H. And instead of Rambo with an M, it has an N in it, so it's Rambo. Like, every time stuff like that popped up, I'm just like... It reminds me of that AVGN joke where, you know, I think it was in one of the Castlevania reviews, um, like, in the credits, somebody was credited with an obviously fake name that was supposed to be a parody of an actual celebrity, uh, and then the nerd says something to the effect of, you know, that's like me doing a parody of uh, Spielberg and calling it Steven Gielberg. Like, there's nothing clever about that. They have a th running gag where it's Rocky versus Rambo, and the joke is you have Rocky in one corner, Rambo in the other, and then, you know, as Rocky puts up his fists, then Rambo pulls out, you know, a machine gun or a crossbow and shoots Rocky and then he goes down. Uh, there's an Indiana Jones reoccurring skit where it's Indy trying to take a statue off of a pedestal, but then replace it with a sack to try and, like, weigh it down. There's a Pink Panther reference where, oh, again, Pink Panther, but Panther is spelled P A N. F-H-E-R? Every single time. It's the same bit. Slightly different, but it's the same thing every time. Where you have a cartoon detective following some paw prints, and then uh, a giant panther that looks relatively realistic, uh, you know, jumps out and mauls him. That's it. Every single time. It's the same thing. And, like, by the half an hour mark, I was like, okay, they're doing the same things over and over and over again. There's one skit where it's like, it made me wonder when was this supposed to be released, because it's such a 2000s joke. Uh, one of the transition slides says, Lord of the Wings. And they have stock audio of George W. Bush talking about, like, not wanting to go to war with Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but then he puts on a ring, and then he starts talking like Gollum, and it's a person doing a Gollum impression, and it's like, you know, we want to invade, we want to take their oil, yeah. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, this was released in 2017. Like, who was making George W. Bush jokes at that point? Like, the only thing I can think of as of late that's actually funny are those AI president videos you see on YouTube. A lot of those are really funny. Um, but this just felt like, hey, maybe if this was released during the Bush administration, maybe it would mean something, but it wasn't. In terms of the production, I gotta say, a lot of the live action stuff look like YouTube videos. Like, they look like the poor man's college humor. And that's coming from someone who's stopped caring about college humor a long, long time ago. But a lot of them just look like YouTube videos. And I was thinking, like, maybe if these were uploaded in, like, 2010 YouTube, like, the early years, like, 2010, 2011, 2012, like, maybe these could have passed. But the fact that it's compiled into a movie just kind of struck me as odd. They're all one single shot most of the time. It's always just somebody typically in front of a green screen or in like some kind of singular location and the camera stays perfectly static the whole time. And very rarely do they ever like tilt it into a different direction. And it just makes me think like, wow, did they just like rush these skits together just so they could compile it into this movie? For example, that Lord of the Wings skit it's all done with this like weird bird's eye angle where it's just showing like a podium, a microphone, and a guy wearing a suit's hands, and then he puts the ring on every so often. Mainly because I can only assume they couldn't get a decent George W. Bush look-alike. Um, and a lot of the audio is clearly 80 yard. Like they <laughs> I feel bad for saying this about Madball's gross jokes, but whenever it comes to the dub work in this movie, it all sounds like the poor man's Monty Python. Like, they, they do that thing, like, in old Terry Gilliam Monty Python animations where, like, just to be funny, they'll dub it with, like, this, like, British murmur. Like, this, like, oh, yes. There's lots of that all throughout the movie. A lot of the animation in these sketches that are animated they're like sub-2004 Newgrounds level animation. Like, it's all... Like, saying it's cheap Flash animation is an insult to cheap Flash animation. Um, and a lot of them are super obvious, too. Like, oh, one of them is Karate Kid, and you have, you know, a kid standing on a post trying to do Karate Kid poses, and the joke is he goes so fast he ends up falling and landing crotch first. That's it. And there's a bunch of sketches that are like that. There's one that's supposed to be Gong with the Wind, and so here, which there's no gong in the skit. The, clearly they just did that because you replace one letter in there, 
automatically it's clever. Um, and you have some lady standing, watching the sunset, and then the wind picks up, and then she blows away. I will give this movie credit for one thing. There was one reoccurring skit that I actually did like, because it felt like a natural progression every time they showed it. Uh, you have a parody of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and again, it's all one static shot where you have a girl in the background who's tied to a chair, screaming for her life, and you see, you never see the guy's face, but it's clearly supposed to be Leatherface. He goes over to a table that has a chainsaw on it, tries to get it started, and the chainsaw breaks. And then every time it cuts back to him, he's trying to fix it, it's not working. One time they cut back, and he's on the phone with, like, a repair man? Like, it's like an automated phone service for, like, a repair company. Um, and then, like, the last time I can remember, they showed this... You know, he eventually just like starts destroying it and smashing it out of anger. And you see the girl in the background, not even tied up anymore, smoking like it's a smoke break and just watching him and just shaking her head like, you idiot. The only other thing I can give this movie a backhanded compliment for is the fact that it wasn't trying too hard to be like uh, an appropriate comedy where every single sketch in that was just trying too hard to be, you know, shocking and controversial and oh, we're so edgy. Unlike Movie 43, it didn't have any big name actors humiliating themselves and having them just do the most embarrassing, terrible, gross out humor. Oh look, we got Hugh Jackman in a sketch and look, he has testicles on his throat. But still, it comes from that same, oh, reference equals funny, oh, somebody getting hurt equals funny school of thought that Friedberg and Seltzer and Craig Moss came from. So I've said this before in the inappropriate comedy and underground comedy reviews, but if you want a sketch comedy movie done right, there's plenty of them to pick from. Kentucky Fried Movie, uh, Amazon Woman on the Moon, even Groove Tube. To our second movie, we have Skeleton Key 2, 667, Neighbor of the Beast. Now, this is going to be very short because I was only able to find clips and a trailer for this movie and I think that's mainly because it seems like this movie is out of print and I tried going to Amazon to see if if they had a DVD so like I would bite the bullet and buy the DVD just to watch it for this video no they have no DVDs and I couldn't even watch it on Prime Video so it's like okay I can't seem to find this movie but I I tried my best so I found a trailer and I found a couple of disconnected clips and uh, well Simply put, this definitely seems like a movie that Red Letter Media would talk about. I mean, this is up there with, like, Feeders and uh, Suburban Sasquatch. It's clearly one of those low-budget movies where just a gaggle of friends got together with their shoulder-mount video camera in 2006, because that's when this movie came out, or 2007, 2008. Every single website sourcing this movie has it listed under a different year. Um... But it is a sequel to another straight-to-video movie called Skeleton Key. Not to be confused with the Kate Hudson movie called Skeleton Key, um, which that's what I thought it was at first. I'm like, is this like a knockoff sequel, kind of like uh, that bootleg Terminator 2 and Jaws 5? But no, it, it's not. It, it is a sequel to an actual straight-to-video movie. Uh, and it is made by the same people, and it apparently has the same characters. Um, but going off of the description off IMDb and the trailer, which you can easily look up, you can find it, just look up Skeleton Key 2 and the trailer for it should pop up on YouTube, Vimeo, uh, they, I think they have it on IMDb, but basically it just looks like a, a bunch of friends have to go and save their friends who are in some kind of cursed town that's being plagued by monsters that are killing and attacking people. I did find it interesting that the town that they go to is called Milbog, and I'm like, yeah, that has to be a, a reference to Troll 2. Like, there's no way. Like, it, 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 that was kind of interesting. It's like, wow, they're going out of their way to reference one of the best worst movies ever made, Troll 2. I remember they specifically have all listed next to each other. They have gore, boobs, and musical numbers. And... Going off of the trailer footage where everything was just in that shot on video format, I was like, oh, we got a winner right here. <laughs> Watching the trailer and reading the description, this is clearly made by people who watched a lot of Sam Raimi and a lot of early Peter Jackson stuff and were like, hey, we can do that. Um, you know what? I will say this. Going off of the trailer, I mean, there was some unique monster props and monster costumes they put together for this thing. So, you know what? 
they had that, that good old ingenuity of, hey, we can put it together with some hot glue gun, duct tape, and stuff from Dad's tool bench. So, you know what? They went ahead and made a movie. Good for them. I've read a bunch of user reviews on IMDb. Uh, three of them gave it a 7 out of 10, praising them for at least trying. So, there's that. But a lot of them were just typical 1 out of 10 star reviews, saying, like, yeah, crappy quality, bad acting, bad jokes. But anyway, on to the last movie, and I did actually watch this in full. Uh, we have Summer of Massacre, which came out in either 2011 or 2012. This is a horror anthology movie that goes down five different stories and eight different killers, and from what I can tell, it is in the Guinness World Records book of having most kills in a movie, clocking in at 155. Before I go into some of the stories, there were two movies it was reminding me of. It was reminding me of Creepshow 3 and Where the Dead Go to Die. It reminded me of Where the Dead Go to Die because of the really low budget quality. I mean, a lot of the special effects and the really crappy CG, which I, again, I get as a stylistic choice and also probably due to some budgetary limitation. Um, a lot of it was looking like visuals straight out of Where the Dead Go to Die. And the reason it was reminding me of Creepshow 3 was because it just has that look of a crappy straight-to-video horror anthology movie. Which, again, just like Skeleton Key 2, there is a target demographic for this movie, horror fans and gore hounds. And if you want movies with just senseless violence and a bunch of gore, this movie is for you, my friend. This movie has a lot of that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, as a person who likes horror anthology movies more in the vein of the first creep show or trick or treat and movies like that um, don't expect a lot of character progression in this movie which again if you're watching a movie like this and you know what you're getting into you're just in there for the kills and I will say this movie very gory and as dumb as a lot of these stories are they're creative um, but just like where the dead go to die expect a lot of shock value I mean, here's what to expect with the stories the first one involves a guy who gets mugged by a couple of thugs and then when he gets up, he starts going on an endless murder spree until he eventually gets revenge on the three thugs. Uh, he kills two of them and then tortures the last one. And that's pretty much it. Uh, the next one is about a girl who goes on a camping trip with some of her friends and she has to take her uh, disabled sister or, or half-sister. I forget the specifics of that. But uh, she takes a bunch of her friends out. A lot of these characters are assholes, like you'd expect in uh, you know a horror anthology like this. You want to see these characters die. Um, so she tries to kill her sister off by pushing her off a cliff. But you know, even though they think she's dead, she gets back up and she goes on a killing spree. And eventually, like the last person that's hurt ends up in a hospital. And other than everybody in this story basically being an asshole. The only other thing that I found interesting was the fact that the main character's name was Kimberly Ann. Because every time, you know, I think it's like Kimberly Ann Weaver or Wheeler or something like that. But every time they said her name, I, I just kept thinking Kimberly Ann Possible. <laughs> so that's, it was like, oh, if only. I have this guy who's on a date with his fiance and he basically reveals that he's the bastard son of the Boogeyman. Uh, who took the form of a human man and called himself Mr. Boogans. It looks like Curly from the Three Stooges, and he has, like, you know, kind of purple paint on his face, and they put, like, distortion on his voice to make it sound high-pitched sometimes and low-pitched on other times. Um, and basically, uh, they go back to the guy's house. His mom is murdered, as well as two police officers. Uh, then he kills the fiancé. Then the main guy goes running for his life, and, you know, the, the boogeyman just kills everyone in his path. And even when it seems like the guy is in the hospital and it seems like he's going to be safe and you know the, they're going to have security try and like watch over him the boogeyman comes in kills basically everyone that gets in his way in the hospital and he kills the the guy who's fourth story definitely seemed like something straight out of creep show three because it's like it tries to kind of sort of not really tap dance around the rim of social commentary because uh, you have it that a bunch of 20 somethings are supposed to be playing I guess high school kids or maybe college students, I don't know. Uh, the point is, they're way too old to be like students who are going to a Christian camp. Um, but they're at this camp and they start to tell uh, a campfire story about 
two gay firefighters who were killed by their homophobic co-workers. They were burned alive. Their corpses came back to life and sought revenge on the their co-workers. Uh, and then it turns out that these 20-somethings posing as teens are apparently connected to those people like and the camp is also close by where their firehouse was story wise this is just so like oh we didn't have enough time or budget to do a lot of stuff with this but they're like all right let's go to sleep and then uh the main girl of the story wakes up and she sees like bodies dismembered or people missing she gets up and she's like oh no they they killed my best friends and it seems like they took her boyfriend away uh, and it was just like, okay, well, you just got all your kills out of the way right then and there. Now you're just down to two main characters versus these two zombies, I guess? Like, even if they went the route of just making them look like knockoff Freddy Kruegers, I would have been like, okay, at least I kind of get it. But no, they just, they just kind of look like naked mole rat human zombie hybrid things. Um, yeah, they take her boyfriend to their cave where they live, and there's a bunch of, like, you know, disembodied corpses lying around. Uh, and then they end up taking out the main girl after a little bit of squabbling. But then, uh, they kill her and her boyfriend, and that's really all about it. And the last story involves three serial killers who they showed confessions for earlier in the movie. And it's all been building up to this, like the beginning of the movie, before it even gets to the title and the credits, uh, they establish that there's a warehouse that has some killings going on in it, and that there's some serial killers holed up inside of it. And all throughout the movie, we, you know, in between each of the stories, we see interviews with these guys, and we finally figure out that, like, they've all come together. At first it seemed like they were all just random, and like, you know, they didn't know each other, but it turns out they do know each other. Um, they're being holed up. Uh, they're surrounded by a SWAT team, and eventually they all die, and one dude, before he dies, sets off some kind of nuclear explosion. Like I said, this movie, it has an audience, and if you want a movie that's just dumb, violent schlock, then yes, go right ahead. This is definitely a movie for you. Um, me personally, like I said, I prefer anthology movies more in the vein of something like The First Creep Show or... Uh, even something like Trick or Treat, where it's like you have the stories that kind of like intertwine with each other. Um, but Creep Show, I kind of liked more because they did take their time more with these stories, and they obviously had a lot more budget to work with. It had slightly better production value than uh, Skeleton Key 2. In a lot of ways, it's very appropriate that I talked about these two movies back to back. Uh, Spoof was a very low budget sketch comedy movie, and uh, this was a low budget horror anthology film, so. Yeah, maybe for a target demographic, I can at least see people watching something like Summer of Massacre. You know, if you're a diehard gorehound and you just want some violent schlock, then yes, it's definitely for you. Uh, spoof, I don't I can't recommend it. I don't know. There's so many better parody movies and sketch movies out there. You don't need to waste your time with that. That does it for this video. Emily, thank you for the request. And um, just tune in for more Media Wiz stuff next time, guys. Um, talking about comic books. Uh, I'm going to be doing my double feature review of Looney Tunes Back in Action, the movie, and then the game. Uh, that was another requested review, but we'll get to that soon. And um, I do want to do a video talking about Smiling Friends. I promised that a long, long time ago, and I finally want to get around to doing it. So look forward to all that next month. Until then, guys, I'm the Media Wiz, because one art form wasn't enough.